Let's open God's Word together, shall we? We are opening up our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Taking a little, a little break from our study of Jonah. You know, we've been going through the book of Jonah. And, um, but I want, to take, I want to take a break today uh, because we're having a baptism today. And baptism is the sign of the new covenant that Jesus Christ made with his followers. It is, in essence, an outward sign of a changed identity, a new reality that has happened inside a person's heart. And so I want to start off with a question, who do you think you are? Has someone ever asked you that question before? Probably if they asked you that question, they were very upset with you, right? <laughs> We, we ask that question usually in a very negative sense. Uh, who do you think you are? But actually, it is, a, it is a crucial question for us to answer of ourselves. Because your identity, the way that you think of yourself, will determine your response to this world and, and, and to the things of this world. Your identity will determine your response to this world and to this life. And so, 1 Peter, in this opening chapter of 1 Peter, we get a good sense from the Apostle Peter of what the Christian identity is, and that's what we're going to be studying this morning. You see, Peter wrote his letter, his first epistle, he wrote it to Christians all over the Greco-Roman world. You'll see in the, in the first verse there, he talks about, you know, to, to elect exiles. He's writing to people who are dispersed in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. This is all over the, the Greco-Roman world at that time, the place that we now to know today to be Turkey. He's writing to Christians all over that world in probably the mid-60s A.D., Right when the culture around them was starting to notice and take offense at Christians and, and what they stood for. For a while, at the beginning of Christianity, it was, you know, most of the surrounding culture assumed that they were just part of Judaism. That they're just Jews that have, you know, a little bit of a different theology about it. But now, around this time, this is getting to the time of Nero, and if you know anything about the Emperor Nero, he was a pretty bad dude for the Christians. He, uh, he blamed the fire of Rome on them and, and initiated this intense persecution on them. And so Peter is writing to Christians in this kind of an atmosphere where the culture around them is starting to go, hey, wait a minute. I'm not so sure I like what you stand for or who you are. And, and, they're, and the Christians are starting to feel discouraged. They're, they're feeling, they're experiencing very real persecution. In this time of rising persecution, Peter needed to assure the Christians that God was still at work in their suffering. And he began by addressing them, reminding them of their identity in Jesus Christ. We may not yet have begun in our culture here today in America, we have not begun to experience the kind of physical persecution that perhaps the early Christians did. But we too live in a society where that is at best suspicious of Christianity and at worst openly opposed to it. Don't we? Amen. So we need to be molded by Peter's message just as much as his original audience did. Peter's message speaks to us today as well. And so as we so, so let's dig into his word here. At the start of the letter, Peter begins with a greeting that would be pretty standard in, in those days. That's a, a letter in ancient Near East, uh, writing a letter, you begin with the name of the author and then the name of the audience. I, Joel, am writing to you, the church of whatever, or to my friend, uh, as, you, as you see in uh, both in Luke's Gospel and the book of Acts, you see Luke starting out this way, addressing his friend that he's writing to. Peter begins the same way. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to those who are elect exiles in the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. This is the opening greeting of his letter, but it's different from a normal greeting in some crucial ways. And the first crucial way we have to understand is that he is outlining the Christian identity. Let me make sure my slides are catching up with me here. We're talking first and foremost about the Christian identity here in these first two verses. And he's going to go on and expound on what this means for, for our lives in the following verses, but at least we need to notice a couple of things first of all here in verses 1 and 2. Isn't it interesting how intent Peter is, right off the bat, with, with outlining the identity of his audience? Why? Why would this be significant? Well, another thing that was happening in the early church is that the demographic would have been, in the, in the earlier stages, primarily women and slaves. These would be the people that were, and, and you see evidence of this in the book of Acts when you see um, Paul planting churches and you, you hear these names of women like Lydia who was hosting, uh, hosting Paul or, or the first converts there. And so in a, in a world in which, in a church in which, you've got a disproportionately large amount of people that the rest of the culture looks down on that have a lower status in the culture, think about what Peter's words would mean to people in this kind of church. Think about what it would mean to be a slave in Cappadocia, for instance, and to be told, I'm writing to you who are an elect exile according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. My identity is not just wrapped up in my identity as a slave. My identity is wrapped up in what God has done for me. Who am I? Well, first of all, I'm elect, he says, to those who are the elect. They're honored, singled out by God, chosen by God before the foundations of the world, as we read in other New Testament epistles. But they're also exiles. They don't belong to this world anymore. That's kind of the idea that, that Peter is getting at here. Some have taken his reference to exiles here to, to be a reference to Jewish Christians, because the Jews, as you know, uh, from, from Old Testament, were called exiles. They, they were taken off into captivity in, in Babylon and also in Syria. And the Jews were thought of as exiles. But Peter makes it clear as he goes throughout his letter that he's not just writing to Jews who became Christians. He's writing to Gentiles. Pagans that became Christians as well. And he's identifying them as exiles. They are the people of God who are not just exiled out of physical, the physical land of Israel into Babylon. They are, they are people that are placed in this world but they don't belong to this world. Their true home is somewhere else. No matter where we are in this world, our true home is somewhere else. And that's what he's going to be getting at in verses 3 and following. How? How are they able to be considered these elect exiles? Well, he, he outlines it in verse 2 there. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, First of all, let's, talk, let's unpack that a little bit. Foreknowledge, in, in scriptural sense, knowing, especially as you look at the Old Testament, the way that, that the Bible uses this term, know. God knew these people. Or I have, Jesus said, I, I don't know you. I have not known you. Depart from you, sinners. Knowing has to do with this idea of God choosing to show his covenant love towards someone. It's not just a head knowledge. It's, it's a... It's a bestowing of God's love upon a person. In 1 Corinthians 6.11, we, we see this referenced. We see the idea of God's knowledge, his, his foreknowing someone outlined and talks about this. 
That's 2 Corinthians 6 11. Let me go to 1 Corinthians. How about that? Paul is talking to the Corinthian church and he's talking about all these people that won't make it into the kingdom of God. Thieves, dr greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, all these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he says in verse 11, and that's what some of you were. Such were some of you. But you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were washed. God chose you. He drew you out from that life that you were in. Your identity is changed. In the book of Romans, we, we read that he, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to his image. God has reached into our lives of his own merciful grace and drawn us. He has ordained our salvation. But it's not just the Father, he says, he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, he also goes on to say, in the sanctification of the Spirit. So what does the word sanctification mean? It has to do with setting apart, setting someone or something apart for service to God. It, we often use this term in, to refer to the, the gradual process that God works in our lives to make us more and more into the image of Christ, and that is correct. But it also, the Bible refers to how we were sanctified in the past tense. We, we have been set apart to Christ by faith in Him already. So it is, it is when Paul talks here, and Peter, sorry, talks here, of being elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, he's referencing the way that the Holy Spirit applies this work of salvation to our heart, draws us to himself. And then he, he, he finishes by saying, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with his blood. When he talks about the sprinkling of the, of the blood of Christ, it would it ought to make our minds go back to the Old Testament in the Old Covenant when God initiated his covenant for the first time with the Israelite people, there was there was a sprinkling of blood for the purification of the people in Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 to 8. We read how blood, how an animal had to be sacrificed, and then its blood was sprinkled on the altar, it was sprinkled on the people, it was, it was the sign of God's covering them. So Jesus, the Son, accomplishes our salvation by his blood, by his sacrifice on the cross. But he's not only the one who accomplishes our salvation, he is the object of our obedience as well. He says there, for obedience to Jesus Christ. I like the way that uh, one commentator put it. He talks about how conversion is not merely an intellectual acceptance of the gospel, nor is it faith with a blank slate. Conversion involves obedience and submission to the gospel. And that's what we see here. Peter talking about how we have been called by God, we have been, we have been elect by God, by, according to him, the foreknowledge of the Father, and the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ. And Paul references the obedience of faith in Romans chapter 1 and also in Romans 16. So maybe another way to think about this is that the Father ordains our salvation, the Son accomplishes our salvation through his blood, and the Holy Spirit applies that salvation to our hearts. We see Paul, Peter referencing Father, Son, Holy Spirit here in the work of salvation. And he says, this is what you are. This is what defines you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have trusted in him, you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, to obedience to Jesus Christ and strengthening his blood. How has it changed?
change things for us if we see ourselves through the lens of all that our trying God has accomplished on our behalf? Are you willing to embrace, this is something that we each need to ask ourselves, are you willing to embrace your true identity as those who are in the world, but not of it, as Jesus references in John 17? Are we perhaps trying to root our identity in something other than this? Something that the world promises will bring peace, joy, happiness, like job, your possessions, perhaps your relationships, maybe your hobbies are what you want to define you. Maybe it's your bank account that you want to define you. What defines you? God, in his grace, our trying God, has drawn us in and made it possible for us to live in a different way, to live a different identity because of what he has done. What does it mean to embrace this identity, though? That's the part that Peter gets to next. What are the implications for our Christian lives? Well, first and foremost, Peter talks about how we can rejoice in our secure hope. We rejoice in our secure hope. Look at verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And then he begins verse 6 by saying, In this you rejoice. You rejoice in what God has done. Notice here again that this, our hope, this hope that we have is a work of God's mercy through Christ. In verse 3, he talks about how God, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Here again, we see the work of our triune God. God causing us to be born again according, according to what Christ has done. He accomplished this work on our behalf. And this hope that we have is hope of the life that we were meant for, this, the life to come. To an inheritance, verse 4. We have been called to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This hope is a sure hope that we have. God is the one keeping your inheritance. And remember, again, who the original audience would have been disproportionately, it would have been disproportionately people in society that don't get an inheritance, right? Inheritance would go through the male line, and slaves are not included in that, unless, uh, aside from very special circumstances. An inheritance, each and every one, is given an inheritance, held, kept, by our loving Father in heaven for you. But it's not just the inheritance that's being kept. Look at verse 5. It's kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. You see, God's not just holding our inheritance. He's holding us. He sustains us through faith. Do you see what it says there? By giving us the faith to believe, to follow him, We, too, are being guarded. And that's why Paul can say in Philippians, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And he says later in Philippians chapter uh, 2, he says that you ought to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's a serious business to exercise this faith that you have. But he says because it's God who works in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. God is at work in us, holding on to us. We can rejoice in our secure hope 
But not only that, we can recognize our trials as a necessary tools in God's hands. Look at verses 6 to 9. In this you rejoice, you rejoice in this inheritance that you look forward to, though now for a little while, I'm reading from the NSV, uh, the ESV, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, when, when Paul, or when Peter, I'm going to keep making that mistake, well, it's Peter writing this, but I'm so used to talking about Paul. When Peter writes here, now for a little while, what's he talking about there? You've been, you've been beset with trials for a little while, if necessary. This doesn't make much sense in, in the way that we understand it today. When he talks about a little while, he's actually referring to this eternal perspective that he outlined in verses 3 to 5. So he began by talking about this eternal inheritance that we've been promised. And he says, now, here in this life, by comparison, what does it look like? A little while. So not to, this is not to promise us that uh, things are always going to go easily in this life. Actually, it's the exact opposite. Now, for this little while of our lives, before eternity, we are beset with trials. And, and when he says there, if necessary, is actually, um, the, the, it carries the idea that uh, since it is necessary. Think about it. Um, when, when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And he says, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Right? Yes, turn the stones to bread. Satan is, is using this, not, not saying like, you know, if, like, I'm not sure. He's, he's, he's really saying, since you are, since you claim to be the Son of God, and I know that you are, then you should prove it by doing this. When, when, uh, when we think of an if-then kind of, kind of uh, language thing here, this word if is carrying that kind of connotation. And we know it because we see in verse 7, you have been grieved by various trials so that there's a purpose. These trials are necessary. For what? For proving the tested genuineness of your faith. I like the way that uh, the NIV, if you're reading one of the, the Bibles in the pew in back the seat in front of you, it translates this, instead of saying if necessary, it says, although now you may have had to suffer. It kind of, it's, it's getting a little closer to this idea of this is a necessary thing. I really like the way the New Living Translation has, has put it. It says, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. It really drives home that point, doesn't it? That Peter's not just saying like, well, it might be necessary for some, but it might not be necessary for others. Uh, you know, we'll see how it works out. No, he's saying now, you, as, a, as an elect exile, uh, a child of God, you have thought it has been necessary for you to endure trials in this life. So that tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The trials are necessary because they prove the genuineness of our faith. A professor that used the, used the, the phrase, faith has to be tested in order to be identified. Faith has to be tested in order to be identified. I can tell you that I believe that table will hold my weight. But how do you know that my faith is genuine? i got to go sit on it. I won't do that right now. <laughs> it's just... Hey, no, I will. Because <laughs> I believe that this table can hold my weight. There you go. My faith is genuine. Whew. Yay, thank you. We're talking about something, we're talking about faith that is placed in something far, far greater and far more serious than a table, aren't we? Yeah. And so Peter says, your faith, God is bringing things into your life 
trials which will demonstrate the genuineness of your faith. And not just that. He says in, in the end of verse 7, it will be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We see throughout the Bible references to the fact that there are heavenly rewards awaiting those who are faithful to him. We look forward to our reward. And this results in rejoicing. Look at verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, we have to recognize that this, this faith that we have in Jesus is not faith that's based on seeing him. You have not seen him, but you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Through the eyes of faith, especially in trials, we can rejoice because we see Jesus and the eternal life that he brings us as we trust him. So what, is a, what does a Christian identity do? It gives us the opportunity to rejoice in our secure hope. It means that we can recognize uh, trials as necessary tools in God's hands. And then at the end of this section, he talks about how we can understand redemptive history through its apex, who is Jesus. Look at what he says in verses 10 and following. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied long ago, they prophesied about this grace that was to be yours. They searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ that was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. What is he saying there? The prophets who were prophesying, they were trying to figure out, when is this all going to happen? How is it going to happen? And, and they were inquiring into it carefully, and they, they couldn't see the whole picture. But yet, he says it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. It wasn't for them to see the whole picture, but you. They were serving you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Even the angels haven't seen the whole picture. And yet, we are in a position, we look back on what Christ has done, what God has accomplished for us in Christ, and we do see the pinnacle of human redemptive history. We see the fulfillment, Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets, all these things. If the prophets couldn't see the whole picture, but remained faithful to God, maybe we can too. Certainly we can too. Because not only do we have the, the piece of the picture the prophets never, never had, we have the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, sanctifying us day by day to walk with Him. And so think, I want us to think about our perspectives. I want us to think about our identity. Where, where does my mind go when I think about this life, when I think about my situations, where does my attention tend to wander? Toward the temporary or the eternal? Am I rejoicing in my secure hope? Am I fighting against the trials of God in my life or seeking to grow within them, leaning on the God who is keeping not only my eternal inheritance but me as well? What do we do with this? Well, it says it in verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What do we do with this? We set our hope fully on the grace of God. What this means is to strive for an eternal perspective as you go through these necessary trials. Keep your eyes on the one who carries you in those trials, who is using those trials for your good. But it also means striving for an eternal perspective in our blessings as well. That I'm not counting on the good things that I've been given to give me hope and purpose and identity. I accept these things as a good gift from the God who loves me and gave himself for me. And I seek to use these good things that I've been given for his glory. Not for my own selfish ends. What does it mean to set your hope fully on the grace of God? It means whether in trial or whether in blessing, I live for him not for myself. An eternal perspective like this is not automatic. 
It is developed over time by consistent practices that turn our attention toward what our triune God has done for us and who we are in Christ and what we look forward to at his return. It's only this kind of perspective which will enable us to rejoice in the midst of trials. And not only that, to recognize that the trials themselves are not, they're not mistakes, aberrations in the plan of God, but they're rather tools in his loving hands, which he uses to develop us, to prove the genuineness of our faith that he has planted in us by his Holy Spirit. We are called to so much more than a good life, just, just to live a good life. We are called to an eternal salvation that is kept in heaven for us. This life is preparation for that. Imagine what it could look like as we come to see ourselves more and more through our true identity in Christ. Imagine how it will impact our families, our neighbors, our co-workers, when they see us enduring suffering with hope, when they see us spending our time and money on things of eternal value, living for the ultimate someone who is greater than ourselves, instead of the fading, momentary, empty pleasures of this life. Who do you think you are? The answer to that question lies at the core of the Christian life. Let's pray. Father, we need your grace to understand who we are in Christ and to live into that identity. And so we pray for your strength. We pray that you would continue to mold and shape us into the image of Christ through our trials and, and also through the blessings that you have given to us. Surrender to you. Lord, give, us, give us the strength to surrender ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.